Hello and hi, and thanks for coming back to this empty hall in space time. The alley's under construction, and there's only one artisanal workshop out in Germany qualified to fix it. So, until then, I thought I'd spend this video talking about my own story, Immortal, and setting the scene in the late Pleistocene and Paleolithic era. Sound good? Great. So let's take a quick look at the time period Immortal's gonna start in. It's a nice, even 50,000 BCE, which lodges it right in the late Pleistocene and late Paleolithic periods. But first, it's important to note that the Pleistocene and Paleolithic are two different definitions of time. The Pleistocene Epoch is an unofficial geological time period that records the rock record of the Earth, specifically the time frame wherein we had glacial and interglacial cycles, and lasted from 2.6 million years ago to 11,700 years ago. Ago, and is divided into four ages, the Galazian, Calabrian, Chibanian, and the Late Pleistocene. The Paleolithic Epoch is the latest section of the Quaternary Period, which itself is the latest section of the Cenozoic Era, but we can just leave it there, it's a bit of a Russian nesting doll situation. Meanwhile, the Paleolithic Period records the time of early hominid development, beginning from the first evidence of tool usage around 2.58 million years ago to the agriculture cultural epoch 11,700 years ago. Isn't it neat how correlated those two timelines are? So, when you Google information about the late Pleistocene period, by far the most dominant results are going to talk exclusively about the Ice Age that happened from 26 to 20,000 years ago. This is a bit confusing since we are still currently in an Ice Age, and the Pleistocene has had way more than just one glacial maximum. Uh, let me explain. The Ice Age we're currently in started 2.6 million years ago and is called the Quaternary Glaciation and occurred at the start of that Quaternary period I mentioned before. The actual definition of an Ice Age is just when there are glaciers on the Earth's poles, which we still definitely have today. And what we call the Ice Age was just a point in time when those glaciers spread across more of the planet for a little bit and the temperature got a lot colder. And that is actually called a glacial. And when that ice receded back to the poles and the world got warmer, like it did 11,700 years or so ago, we call that an interglacial. So we are currently in an interglacial period in what is a long history of the world cycling in and out of cold, glacial and warm interglacial periods. But back to the matter at hand. The last glacial period started 110,000 years ago and ended about 15,000 years ago, spanning over pretty much the entire late Pleistocene timeline. But the last glacial maximum was from 26,000 to 20,000 years ago. So the world was in a gradual state of cooling for about 84,000 years until it reached its maximum levels of cold. But how do we know exactly how cold it was back then? I'm glad you asked, through nifty little things called ice cores. So through these cores, we can tell that the Earth's average yearly temperature 50,000 years ago was about 5 degrees Celsius and 9 degrees Fahrenheit below today's average. And by the glacial maximum, that temperature drops to 10 degrees Celsius and 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, that doesn't sound too bad. What's a couple degrees difference in the massive range of temperatures we get across the Earth every year? But there's a lot more at work here than temperature. In fact, even today, we don't fully have a solid idea of how or why ice ages happen. And it's a topic of open academic study. But what we do know is what exactly happens when the world works itself up to a glacial maximum. Here, the key topic is glaciers. They are the end-all and be-all of the glacial period. These glaciers spread down from the north bit by bit, until by the maximum they covered roughly 30% of the world's landmass, with the surrounding northern oceans being completely frozen over. And let's talk about how these glaciers form. Every year, the area around the glaciers have snow, and that snow doesn't go away when the winter ends because it's either sitting on ice or resting in arctic temperatures. And so the next year comes and it snows again, and this new layer of snow sits on the first, and year after year, more and more layers are added to the ice, until after hundreds and thousands of years you end up with massive condensed glaciers that just keep growing and growing and there's nothing anyone can do to stop them. There are also a few different types of glaciers. 
ice sheets, which cover both land and sea, ice fields and ice caps, which form at higher altitudes and are typically smaller than ice sheets, alpine glaciers, which originate in alpine mountains, cirque glaciers, which are like alpine glaciers, but form sort of bowls that are often filled with meltwater, valley and Piedmont glaciers, which flow down from alpine areas where they melt at lower altitudes, tidewater and freshwater glaciers that form on land but dissipate in bodies of water. Also, small pieces of both of these types can break off or carve and make icebergs. And lastly, rock glaciers that are filled with rocks and debris and other junk when they form, which makes them a lot sturdier than other glaciers and mean they also melt a lot slower. But we're not done with our buddies the glaciers yet, because these guys are the key to everything. Their impact on the environment was devastating when they were at their peak, thanks to, among other things, permafrost. A margin of permafrost spread at minimum 200 kilometers from the glaciers themselves. These things were harbingers to the unstoppable force of freezing death that crept onwards towards the Neolithic people of the mainland. But what, may you ask, happens when these glaciers grow bigger and more and more of the Earth's salt and freshwater is trapped in ice form? Well, <laughs> for one thing, it gets very, very dry. No moisture in the air and way less rain than what is usual means the environment becomes very arid. And aridity means more friction in the air, dry lips and crackly hair. It means little accidental static shocks when you touch someone else. It means thunderstorms without rain. A lot of thunderstorms. It means potentially yearly bushfires and a rise in less water-needy plant life, which means more steppe and tundra-like environments. It means the rise of the mammoth steppe. The mammoth steppe was what sat between the glaciers and everything else. A single massive biome completely unique to any other we have today. At the height of the glacial maximum, this biome spread straight across the world from Canada to the Arctic islands to China. It was cold, arid and surprisingly high productivity. The land was the primary ground dominated by megafauna too. But we'll circle back to that. And equally as prominent as the aridity, the world's water being trapped in glaciers meant that the ocean level dropped, like a lot. The ocean was at its lowest point 18,000 years ago, dropping 120 meters lower than what it is today. And this allowed for land masses that were previously entirely submerged to reveal themselves. And the most famous of these land masses was the Bering Land Bridge. A small aside here, the Bering Land Bridge is so incredibly fascinating as a theory for human immigration into the Americas. The Bering Bridge connected Siberia and Alaska together. And the idea goes that during its time above the sea level from up to 30,000 years ago, the bridge allowed for a number of species, including humans, to travel to the Far Eastern continent. This is a pretty widely accepted concept, but there's still a bit of debate there. And fascinatingly, there is archaeological evidence that sections of Siberia and Alaska apparently have a history of communication and trade that can be traced back to about a thousand years ago, way before the arrival of Western immigrants. It's not much, but it definitely sparked the imagination in me. I actually misunderstood a few key points in my original research and wasted an hour trying to find if there was any evidence of this trade relationship going even further back than a thousand years to maybe eight or even 18,000 years ago because the idea of two groups of people who originated from the same place and had contact with one another being cut off from each other when the bridge was submerged only for them to never really forget what they lost and rediscover their brethren hundreds or thousands of years later is the kind of thing that makes my heart beat. But alas, twas not meant to be, obviously. Human cultural memory isn't even long enough to remember immigration from a hundred years ago. Anyways, where was I? Oh, right, megafauna. Pleistine flora and fauna were in many ways the same as today's, but there are important differences, particularly with flora and how it was distributed amongst the environment. Biomes took varyingly different shapes in the Pleistine because the environment globally was different, with overall colder temperatures, but comparatively much milder seasons, with less extreme hot and cold spikes throughout the summer and winter months. The ice sheets again really impacted the environment. 
Where there are plenty of mixed forests in Europe now during the modern interglacial, during the last Pleistocene glacial there was primarily open tundra and the mammoth steppe with sparse to no trees throughout massive portions of Europe. This also means that the biological community or food chain was completely different to what it is today because of again these steadier temperatures but also more biodiversity and intersecting biomes meaning there was a wider range of fauna in each habitat. And with that fun note we can say way finally into Evolution hit mammals like a brick wall, and it continues to hit us with bricks every couple of generations to make sure we don't die from extreme cold or heat, or like tigers. Uh, <laughs> What I'm trying to say in this awful analogy that I'm not going to fix is that mammals evolve fast. And so when the Pleistocene ice ages started ramping up, bringing with it a cooler, more arid climate, new migration routes like the Bering Bridge from earlier, and a rapidly changing mix of biomes and environments, a lot of mammals adapted to the shift. And in particular to the tundras that now dominated progressively larger parts of the earth that weren't covered in ice. Let's talk megafauna. The major ones that I researched for Immortal were European megafauna, excluding the ones on the Mediterranean islands that were still around during 50,000 BCE. Yeah, did you forget that was when the story's supposed to be set? Because I did when I started researching, <laughs> clearly. Anyways, without further ado, the major megafauna were the Camelus noblocci, a species of large camel that lived in dry steppes and semi-deserts. The cave bear, also known as Ursus spileus. The cave bear was a surprisingly herbivorous cave-dwelling creature. There's a lot more known about the cave bears than most megafauna, since they lived and died in caves, and so were better preserved than other animals that lived out in the grasslands. Interestingly, cave bears are also the focus of certain bear cults that sprung up in Neolithic communities. The woolly rhinoceros, a species that spanned over Eurasia, the woolly rhino is the ancestor of the modern rhino and was also a common quarry for humans and Neanderthals before its extinction 10,000 years ago. The European wild ass. This was a particularly hardy species of donkey that spread over Europe, and while the population splintered greatly around 26,000 years ago, they only went extinct 2,500 years ago, in the same century as the construction of the Pyramid of Giza. Interestingly though, they are not the ancestors of the modern donkey. That was the African wild ass. The European Ice Age Leopard. A mountain and alpine dwelling wildcat, the Ice Age leopard is fairly similar to modern leopards. The steppe bison lived on the mammoth steppe. They were massive things that spread as far as their biome and are more or less the ancestor of the modern European bison, who are actually hybrids between the steppe bison and the auroch. The aurochs were wild Eurasian bovine who were domesticated by humans during the Neolithic Revolution. But before then, they originated in Asia and migrated west during warmer periods of interglacial. The steppe mammoth, not quite the woolly mammoth, the steppe mammoth lived with the steppe bison as happy mammoth steppe siblings. The steppe mammoth was the still living ancestor of the other mammoths, primarily the woolly mammoth and straight tusked elephant. The woolly mammoth, the star of the ice age, the woolly mammoth was pretty important to Neolithic humans as a source of food during the darkest days of the ice age. They were used for clothing, meat and a huge variety of resources, the most interesting of which were their hides and bones being made into tents by the Ukrainian humans of 26,000 BCE. The straight tusked elephant. These fellas lived in Europe in small herds and were also hunted and scavenged by humans. They went extinct around the same time as the steppe mammoth though, 33 to 30,000 years ago. Trogontherium. The Trogontherium was a temperate Eurasian giant beaver that was again a popular quarry for humans. Funnily enough, it's not very strongly related to the American modern beaver. Sabertooth cats. While you probably have a very specific image in your mind when I talk about the saber-toothed tiger, there were actually dozens of saber-toothed cat species, none of which were actually tigers. These cats roamed Eurasia and were roughly lion-sized, and I will not be elaborating on the dozens of specific cat species because I would like this video to be under half an hour. <laughs> Cave lion. Okay, I know what I just said, but these aren't saber-toothed cats. 
These are cave lions, similar to the cave bears these lions lived in, well, caves. According to cave paintings, which is the best evidence we have for how these guys looked, which is just so cool, but anyways, <laughs> these lions didn't look like modern lions in that they didn't have any manes. The Pleistocene wolf, different to the dire wolves, which were exclusively in America, the Pleistocene wolf was slightly larger than a grey wolf. The Pleistocene wolf was good at adapting to their climates, and so spread out over most of Eurasia. And later on, these wolves split and evolved into both the modern grey wolf and modern dogs. The cave hyena. I almost missed this one in my initial research, but the cave hyena is pretty important. It was bigger and heavier than our modern spotted hyena and was an active hunter as well as a scavenger, particularly during glacials when they needed to hunt to survive. We can also thank these guys for all the large Pleistocene mammal bones we can find today in horizontal caves, sinkholes, mud pits, and along rivers. And lastly, the Irish elk. The Irish elk is an absolutely fascinating species that lived across Eurasia. It's believed their habitat would have been grasslands over forests because the male Irish elk grew absolutely massive antlers. Look at these photos, I mean they, they don't look real. They were 2.1 meters tall at the shoulder and just like with the cave lion we only have any real idea of what they looked like thanks to cave art. After the younger Dryas their population was badly damaged but they still managed to keep on trucking until about 7,700 BCE. And um, side note, I just think the Irish elk are insanely cool. And as a little heads up, I will be a thousand percent including them in the first arc of Immortal. It's gonna be great, promise. <laughs>But before I forget, we're also talking about the fauna of Europe here, and that includes Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Uh, talking about human evolution is a bit of a minefield though. Between misinformation and new fossils and transitory fossils constantly being found, it's safe to say that the origin of humans is more confusing than Five Nights at Freddy's Law, but with a lot more outdated theories and a lot more misinformation too. Depending on what site you look at and what date it was made in, Homo sapiens were fully split from Homo heidelbergensis anywhere from 300 to 100,000 years ago in East Africa and Southern Europe, with the Neanderthals only evolving a good 200,000 years ago in Europe during the last interglacial. The Neolithic family tree is again a bit fuzzy, but it's thought that the common ancestor of both species were Homo heidelbergensis. This absolute insanity also translates directly into the debate on when and how humans immigrated into Europe from Africa. With dates ranging between 300,000 and 50,000 years ago for when Homo sapiens or Cro-Magnons entered Europe. Another thing I found myself considering when researching human immigration is that it tends to be written as if there was a conscious mass movement into Eurasia and later America by humans with a destination or goal in mind. Like a sort of prehistoric manifest destiny. Even in Immortal, I found I'd written in this purpose in our nomads movements dictated by them following the North Star to a promised land of plenty. Ultimately, I'm not sure if this is my own biases or the way some of the articles were written, but I thought it was somewhat interesting to note. Um, it also doesn't help that nowadays we don't really have an equivalent experience to relate to this long-term scale of human immigration. We don't have new, unknown places that everyday people can just explore on Earth and interplanetary travel is being planned by people with far more knowledge and intention than what I think would have been present in early hunter-gatherers. So my running theory is that their nomadic lifestyle would have naturally led humans further and further out into the world, but I'm just not sure here. Um, just thought I'd mention it since it's been on my mind a lot since I thought of it. But now that I've gone through the heavy lifting with you all, let's set the scene for the world 50,000 years ago. Put together with good old strings and thumbtacks and the best I could do with the online sources I had available. <clears throat> So the highlands in the south are covered in woodlands, mixed temperate forest and boreal forests unlike anything we have today, with a much wider range of plant and wildlife than what we're used to. This is where our nomads spend their winters, where they're better sheltered from the snow and have easier access to resources like wood and winter forageables. The local mountainous caves are filled with cave bears, lions and hyenas, so our humans have to either find an empty one or clear them out before they can even hope to use caves as shelters. 
Sometimes they do, using fire, but other times they don't risk it, resting under overhangs in animal skin shelters and dugout burrows. The winters and summers are mild, but the average temperature is negative 5 degrees Celsius below today's average, making the average temperature in the woodlands a nice, toasty negative 7 to 13 degrees Celsius, or 19.4 to 55.4 degrees Fahrenheit. But the mammoth steppe in the north are flatter, with no shelter, and so their temperatures are more extreme. During the winter, the place is a death trap, covered in snow and filled with small brooks and rivers and bogs. If the water isn't frozen over completely, you can just fall in and you will die either immediately or later of hypothermia. And if you aren't spotted as easy prey out in the middle of nowhere, then you're going to freeze to death, simply because there aren't any trees to cut down as firewood, and you only have so many spears and bones you can use as fuel. But in the summer, the place is thriving, filled with megafauna and nutritious grasses and plant life. They make the perfect hunting grounds for our persistence hunters. The water running through the rivers is almost always cold, originating from the glaciers up in the Alpine mountains, hundreds of kilometers away. Which is refreshing, because the weather is as warm as it will ever get, with temperatures rising up to the mid-20s Celsius. The sea level is currently 70 meters below what it is today, and so when our nomads see the ocean, probably not more than once or twice during their entire lives, it's more likely than not at the bottom of a treacherous cliff made up of the continental shelf and slope. The environment is arid, with thunderstorms more common than today, particularly in the dry summers, and the further north you go, the colder it gets. But the nomads keep moving deeper and deeper into the steppe, sometimes from necessity, looking for better hunting when it's been a particularly hard season, and some trying to follow the north star of their hunter god to a paradise beyond. But those who go never seem to return. For some, that's a terrifying reason to never go beyond the lands they know, and for others it's a challenge to finally discover what's beyond the hunting grounds and return to tell the tale. And although most nomads have never seen them, those who dared to venture north find other strange clans in the icy mountains. These others have bodies that seem stretched out of proportion, with uncanny, unpainted faces. They wear unfamiliar clothes and speak in a language similar but eerily distinct to the many dialects of the nomad speech. Sometimes these creatures can be seen wandering south into the mammoth steppe, hunting, just like them, but with strange weapons and unfamiliar tactics.